Lester Pearson's work for peace in the 1950s earned him a Nobel Prize, led to the creation of the famed UN Peacekeeping Force, and helped build Canada's reputation as an important middle power. Oh, and it eventually helped make him Canada's 14th Prime Minister in 1963. A new book details that formative time for the country and the world. It's called The Diplomat, Lester Pearson and the Suez Canal Crisis. And its author, Anthony Anderson, joins us now for more. Nice to have you back here. Nice to be here. How's it going? Good. Uh, this is terrific. So much enjoyed this, but I want to start actually not talking about him. I want to start talking about you. Right. Where are you from? Um, bit of a convoluted story. My dad was born here. He left in the 40s to go overseas. We grew up around the world. I don't think I lived anywhere longer than four years. We would come here for summers, and my impression of Canada was this lovely, sunny place with great beaches. <laughs> really? Partly. That's kind of a... And then um, you know, I moved here in 80 to go to Queens. How old were you at the time? I was 18, so okay. university. And um, the country was in the midst of the constitutional quagmire. You know, Trudeau was uh, patriating the amending formula and it looked like the country was falling apart and I became fascinated by this country I knew nothing about. Okay, but that's early 1980s. So yes. you obviously were not here for any of Lester Pearson's prime ministership. Nothing. So where did the fascination with Mike Pearson come from? Well, I think when I came here and I realized I knew nothing about the country, I started asking questions and a lot of roads led to Mike, you know, led to Lester. And, you know, I discovered that the... Um, the legislation he brought in when he was prime minister still defines us today. The diplomacy he carried out in the 40s and 50s determined who we were in the world. You know, he put us on the map. And I just became obsessed with telling a story. Obsessed? That That's a, a, it's an interesting <laughs> choice of word. I cannot explain it. I cannot rationally explain it. I just knew that at a certain point in my life, I decided I had to tell a story because it hadn't really fully been... T I mean, I started, out, I started out wanting to make a documentary. And so I began calling people up who were still around, you know, Mitchell Sharp. Mr. Sharp, do you mind if I just come and talk to you about Pearson? And I would go and film him, and then I would go to someone else. You know, I spoke to John Turner and Alan McKeck and everyone who worked with them. And by luck, I happened to talk to some of the last diplomats who were with him during Suez. So I talked to someone called Jeff Murray, who was in New York with him during Suez. I talked to someone called Sir Peter Ramsbottom, who was the last surviving uh, member of the British delegation. And couldn't make the doc, and um, friends began hounding me to write a book, and I eventually wrote the book. So this book is 20 years in the making. I don't like saying that in public, but yes. <laughs> it really is. It's a funny thing. Tell me your view on this, because you know we're looking in the United States right now in New York City, mm. where the first secretary of the Treasury is the subject for the biggest boffo hit of all time on Broadway, yeah. right? Alexander yeah. Hamilton. And they're really... There's not that much, actually, if you look at it, on some of the great leaders of this country's history. I mean, there are not a ton of books out there on Mike Pearson. What's no, going on? I've been thinking about this for a long time because as I, you know, came here as a, you know, a stranger to this land and began falling in love with the Canadian story, I had this dawning realization that Canadians are themselves strangers in their own land. I mean, not the chattering classes, not the political class, but by and large, we don't know ourselves. We don't know the story. Um, and I remember on Young Street going into a secondhand bookstore and finding a mint condition copy of Bruce Hutchison's Mr. Prime Minister. I was, I was thrilled. Tell people who he is. Sorry, one of the great journalists from the 40s and 50s and yeah. 60s. And when I went to buy it, the bookseller laughed at me. What are you buying this for? I thought, my God, I mean, even he thinks this is a joke. <laughs> so, I mean, for so many reasons, we do not tell ourselves our stories. I haven't figured that out yet. I've been thinking about it for decades. Um, I've got two daughters going through the public school system. They aren't learning that much about Canada. Hmm. And I think about how, you know, how can I transmit my passion for the country to them? How can I raise them as conscious Canadians? Because it's not out there. It's not in the culture. It's not in our school system. And, you know, I'm baffled by it. Well, we are sort of extraordinarily modest, right? So that's part of the reason we don't like to build statues to our heroes. Yeah. I think also partly there are so many of us have come here to get away from strife and get away from discord and get away from, you know, political nightmares. So in some ways, this is a land where we come to forget the past. Hmm. Interesting way to put it. Mm. Let's uh, tell a bit of the story then mm. about Lester Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S, Pearson, who everybody called Mike, and mm. I never knew why, and I learned it in your book. Tell us why he's called Mike Pearson. Well, Pearson signed up for the Great War, and um, he wanted to join the Royal Flying Corps. And when he was signing up, apparently, 
the squadron commander looked at him and said, Lester, that's not a real fighter's name. I'm not calling you Lester. I'm going to call you Mike. And Pearson took it. And that's where it comes. And, and when he enlisted, he called World War I the greatest and most glorious cause mm. in history. Why did he call it that? He was naive. Everyone else was naive. I mean, even Quebec was for the Great War in the beginning. Everyone thought it was going to be a great six-week jaunt. He was a loyal British subject. He was born in the British Empire, the, that part of it that was called Canada. Born in Toronto, actually, isn't born he? Born in North Toronto. Well, they didn't call it Toronto then. What did they call it? I think it was... Newtonbrook or something, wasn't it? The village was Newtonbrook, and yeah. it got gobbled up by Toronto. Yeah. Um, but there was a village called Newtonbrook. So, I mean, he went off like a loyal British subject, waving the Union Jack to fight in the King's War. But eventually, he wasn't allowed to. What happened? Yeah. Um, it took a long time for this to, uh, to come out. John English, his main biographer, discovered this. Um, Pearson had a nervous breakdown. Then it was called shell shock. He never saw any fighting. He was in a, he was in a distant part of Greece in a medical unit, um, came back to England to join the Flying Corps. He had some crash landings. His roommate was killed. Then he was hit by a bus during a blackout, nearly killed by that impact. And then his closest friend was killed after that. And I think the accumulation of all of those, um, all of those you know, crises shattered his nerves. Uh, what's interesting is he has that background as part of war that no doubt influenced his worldview. Mm -hmm. There's also the fact that he's a PK. He's right. actually a double PK. You know Senator David Smith, yes. former senator? He says, the thing I have in common with Mike Pearson is that not only am I PK, we're both double right. PKs. Right. Preacher's kids. How did that influence his worldview? The Methodists were really interesting because they were not that interested in the afterlife. They wanted to, um, they, were sort of, they were social activists. They wanted to turn the world, they wanted to turn Canada into God's kingdom on earth. They wanted the here and now to be worth living. And I think that infused them. Um, I think they were also internationalists. They wanted to go out into the world. I mean, we denigrate it now. They wanted to go out and convert heathens. And I think there was that missionary impulse in Pearson, especially coming out of World War I, where he'd seen so much grief and death. I mean, that generation of diplomats um, for them, war was no abstraction. Hmm. They had all lost friends. They had all lost family. So, you know, they wanted, uh, they wanted, they truly wanted to make the world a better place. And with Pearson, there was also that added layer of being a Methodist. So you think uh, the combination of being a Methodist, having a father and a grandfather who were both preachers, um, all of the carnage that he saw during World War I, that led him in some respects to diplomacy? No. He, he seemed to luck into it. I mean, there was something about him that was um, really disarming. He seemed to float from adventure to adventure. He drifted out of university. He, I don't know if you know this, he stuffed sausages in Hamilton for a while. He played um, semi-pro baseball. He taught at U of T for five years and was a kind of lousy prof, indifferent. He was also a coach. He was a much happier coach, I think. And he just happened to hear that external affairs, our foreign ministry then, was looking for new candidates and happened to take the exam and happened to score first place. Hmm. But that was late. I mean, he was, um, I think he was 28 when he joined the department. Well, we know he loved baseball because when the Expos mm. were around, the That's Blue right. Jays and the Expos used to play for the Pearson Cup. Right. Which was named after him. Let's bring this picture up, shall we? Here's a photo of Pearson. This is him in his element. At this point, he is uh, Canada's ambassador to the United States. He's at the San Francisco conference, which eventually established the United Nations. And here, Anthony, is how you describe how he worked his diplomatic magic. Here's a quote from the book. His weaving approaches were evident on the ice when he played for Oxford against Swiss teams in the 1920s. One fellow Oxonian and future Governor General, Roland Michener, remembered Pearson as a good stick handler who would swerve back and forth across the rink. He often started from defense position, so the Swiss in their sports columns called him Herr Zigzag which was typical of his play. Diplomat Charles Ritchie observed with admiration that Pearson approached his objectives indirectly, not by method of head-on confrontations. He was incredibly persistent. He would back away from something and then come back to it, come around to it again. That's diplomacy there, isn't it? That is diplomacy. That is, that is Pearsonian diplomacy. <laughs> um, and for Pearson, a lot of it was tactics. He was a superb improviser. He was, um, he was not a dogmatic thinker, so it allowed him to escape positions or just abandon them while everyone else was still clinging to them and often lead the crowd to where the compromise was going to be. So that was him and his element. Hmm. In 1948, he eventually makes the decision to go into partisan politics. Mm -hmm. Becomes the MP for Algoma East, which includes Manitoulin Island, 
serves as Secretary of State for External Affairs, 1963 finally becomes Prime Minister. How much of those skills that he had as a diplomat were transferable to partisan politics? It was a very, very difficult transition. Um, he didn't have, um, he was sort of bad at all the things that really don't matter in the long run. He was terrible on the platform. He had a lisp. He had no public charisma. He was um, great at the things that do matter, like a deep sense of policy, a deep sense of purpose. He, um, he had a hard time saying no to people. Hmm. Uh, and often people would take his zigzagging from position to position to be weakness. Because in politics, if you change your mind, you're apparently you're weak. You're if a you, flip-flopper. You're, you know, if you compromise, you're seen as weak. And he was a superb compromiser. And the flag is a great example of that. The flag we have is not his first design. You know, a more rigid, dogmatic thinker would have clung to the first design, come hell or high water, and failed. Mm -hmm. And Pearson kept moving from design to design until we get the maple leaf. He wanted the Pearson pennant, those, those three maple leaves, yeah, right? Yeah, and blue bars. And blue bars, right. And, and he instead. just let it go when it wasn't working. A good decision. Yeah. We like our flag, right? We like our flag, and yeah. he, um, and that was emblematic. I mean, I think he, Pierre Trudeau gets much of the credit for the can of Canada Pearson actually brought in. You know, there was this new Canada. We even, you know, he abolished um, the death penalty. Things we take for granted now, he implemented, and yet he was a very unpopular figure when he left. He, I don't think he was very loved in 68 when he stepped down. Respected, admired, but I don't think many people were sorry to see him go. Only five years as PM. Yeah. And only minority governments. And it was transformative. Yep, it did. Let's talk about what happened 60 years ago, which really mm -hmm. solidified him, and in some respects, the whole country on the world stage. Here's a map of the Suez Canal that joins the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. It has been called the world's greatest highway. It was also once called the British Empire's umbilical cord, its jugular vein. It carried, at the time, nearly a quarter of all goods destined for England. Anthony, let's tell this story. July 1956, 60 years ago, Egypt's President Nasser does what? Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal Company. And this had been a British and French company. And it was like he had stabbed the British in the chest in broad daylight. I mean, they, you know, Anthony Eden, the Prime Minister at the time, said he has his thumb on our windpipe. Mm -hmm. And the moment Eden heard that Nasser had, quote unquote, taken the canal, Eden was resolved to take it back by force. And what did he do? He couldn't do anything right away. The British just could not mobilize an invasion force. So he had to play a diplomatic game. And Eden was a, a diplomat at heart, much like Pearson. They were contemporaries. So Eden had to tough it out because he wasn't ruthless enough to invade right away. So he had to make noises that he was concerned about international control and concerned about Nasser blocking the canal. And Nasser was very shrewd, and he operated the canal like it was a business. For months? For months. I mean, it flowed smoothly. There was no reason for the British to invade, and Eden kept trying to cook up a reason to invade. And during those months, Pearson did everything he could, because he was friends with Eden, to say, for God's sakes, don't go in. You know, it is working. The British have been dismantling their empire for decades at that point, but, you know, take it on the chin, stiff upper lip, give it up. And Eden could not let it go. How did the Israelis get involved? Well, it's hard to remember, but Israel was only about eight years old at that point, right? Established in 48, this is 56, and there had been border skirmishes ever since. Um, Britain needed a pretext. The French wanted to go in because they were fighting their colonial wall, war in Algeria. And France and Israel were very close at that point. In fact, France was Israel's only ally at that point. And France asked Israel, would you mind invading Egypt <laughs> and giving us a reason to go in, we and the British? And Israel agreed because they were, they were getting jets from France and uh, tanks and nuclear secrets. And Israel wanted an ally. So they were, they were going to oblige the French. They weren't friends with the British. France went to England and said, look, the Israelis are going in. Let them attack Egypt, and we will pose as peacekeepers land in Egypt, separate them, and take back the canal and topple Nasser. What did the Brits think of that? Eden jumped at the idea. Was that a mistake? <laughs> in <laughs> retrospect, yes. <laughs> I mean, people now still can't untangle why such, a, um, why such a seasoned, experienced diplomat like Eden went for something that was so palpably transparent. Well, you pose an idea in the book, which is Eden was pretty hepped up on all sorts of drugs at the time. He was taking sleeping pills and, and, and uppers because he'd had a botched um, gallbladder operation that he never really recovered from. So his judgment was off. 
but he was desperate. He was, he, you know, he'd seen Britain diminished after World War II and he accepted much of it, but this was the last straw. So he decided to, he decided for it, you know, to go for it. Okay, so that's the background to the point where Lester Pearson walks onto the stage and thinks he's got a way to solve all this. Uh, but again, as is classically Canadian, he's dealing with a bit of an issue here. Quebec may have one view, English Canada may have another view, and lots of Canadians at this time still think Britain's in trouble, we're there. How did Pearson sort of untangle all of that? It was a razor thin line to walk, and um, he was accused by many Canadians for being disloyal, for being a traitor to Britain, cheered by other Canadians for standing up to Britain. Um, he never ever condemned Britain during the entire crisis. He, um, he expressed regret, he expressed dismay, he was diplomatic, but he never condemned them because he wanted to keep an opening. I mean, at the time, the Commonwealth was uh, divided along color lines, India, Pakistan, then Ceylon condemning Britain, Australia, New Zealand supporting Britain. We were the only Commonwealth member in the middle trying to be objective, trying to be neutral, or not neutral because we wanted to help Britain, of course, but we, um, you know, uh, Pearson wanted to be the helpful fixer in this case, the mediator. Where was Ike in this? Eisenhower was fighting an election. The last thing he wanted to deal with was a war started by two allies in the Middle East that would drag America in. And the Americans spent the entire summer and fall of 56 desperately trying to rein in the British. And Pearson could see the greatest political nightmare for Canada at the time, the British and the Americans quarreling with each other in public, falling apart, and by the time he got to the General Assembly, they were not talking to each other. Because Britain effectively lied to the US, did not tell them they were going in, and began bombing the outskirts of Cairo without letting Eisenhower know. Hmm. Now you do take considerable pains in the book to sort of paint the picture and go through somewhat exhaustive detail in how... Hopefully not exhausting. Not exhaustive, but, but <laughs> considerable. That's the word I was looking yeah. for, considerable. On how Pearson you know, figured it all out. And he did at the end of the day. Yeah. He figured it all out. What did he do? He skated beautifully. Um, he knew as a middle power we couldn't impose, we couldn't threaten, we couldn't bully. We had to leverage. And so when he got to the General Assembly, he had prepared the Americans in advance for what he wanted to do. If you as a middle power do not have your neighborhood superpower on side, you will achieve nothing. So he worked the Americans for days in advance to say, I want to send in what was then called a UN police and peace force. So they knew what was coming. So you cannot surprise your allies in the midst of a crisis. So he prepped the Americans, got to the General Assembly, spoke to the British delegation who were desperate to be helped out of this mess. I mean, they had no idea what their political masters in London were doing, so they were desperate. And in one instance, one British diplomat came to him literally sobbing to say, Mr. Pearson, you've got to get us out of this you know, fix, please, whatever you can do, get us out of here. Mm -hmm. The whole world descended on him. Every delegation came to him to say, what can we do to help this, or to, you know, to, to, to end this? And some, you know, India was a little suspicious of us. They, you know, you're a, you know, you're a Anglophile, you love Britain, we think you're trying to get them off the hook, and Pearson was trying to get them off the hook. He was also trying to repair the, you know, the Western Alliance, keep the Commonwealth together, restore, you know, the reputation of the UN and get the British, French, and Israelis to withdraw. And somehow, he got all that done. That's pretty amazing. Desperation helps. <laughs> what was the final straw that made Anthony Eden eventually back down? Lester Pearson did not make peace in Egypt. He threw out the lifeline. The British wouldn't take it. It took hardball politics. The Americans effectively threatened to destroy the British currency, the British pound. And at that point, apparently Harold Macmillan, you know, threw up his hands and cabinet said, that's it. We cannot go on any further. End game. And it last, I mean, the British invasion lasted about 24 hours. It was hmm. humiliating. Okay, you say it was humiliating. Anthony Eden resigned over this. He did. The Prime Minister of Britain stepped down over this. Why did he feel he needed to do that? His health was shattered. Um, he had been, he had upped, we know, he admitted in cabinet, he'd upped his drug intake to deal with the stress, and um, his health was absolutely gone. Cabinet wanted him out, the Americans wanted him out. Um, he really didn't have a choice. Hmm. In hindsight, you know, with the benefit of 60 years of looking back at all this, was this as scandalous as it, you know, appeared to be at the time? 
Well, failure is scandalous. I mean, if he had succeeded, he'd be cheered. Um, it really, I mean, it depends how you play it. I mean, the dirty word at the time, you know, the C word was collusion. He had colluded with France and Israel. His mm -hmm. supporters said, no, we entered into secret negotiations to defend our interests. He is, I mean, he is seen to have failed because he had to retreat. If he had taken back the canal, if he had toppled Nasser, he'd probably be a hero. Hmm. Let's fast forward. You say uh, peacekeeping became a state religion in Canada as a result of the blue helmets that mm -hmm. Lester Pearson helped usher in during that time. How did uh, taking part, this country, in the war in Afghanistan challenge that narrative of us as peacekeepers, which had, of course, persisted ever since 1956? I think 9-11 began to change it, because in that, I think we framed the way we began to see the world, that we understood that peacekeeping wouldn't solve every uh, international crisis. And I think we realized slowly that we had forgotten our military history. We'd forgotten our military heritage. We'd forgotten that Lester Pearson was a chief architect of NATO. He knew the UN wasn't going to solve, couldn't uh, provide universal security, so he tried to go for regional security. and he cajoled the Allies to create NATO. He had signed up, you know, as, as a soldier. He wasn't a pacifist. So we forgot that side of him, and I think going to Afghanistan reminded us that we sometimes have to get our hands dirty. Let me follow up on peacekeeping. We have, I think, 29 peacekeepers stationed worldwide right now. Last time we had a seat on the Security Council was 16 years ago. Prime Minister Trudeau says we're going to be seeking a seat in 2021. He wants to revitalize, his word, our peacekeeping efforts. Uh, what kind of role do you think Canada ought to be playing today uh, based on, um, you know, what we could do with the United Nations? It's a much tougher world to operate in. I think even Pearson would be challenged. Um, when he was at Suez, there were something like 70 member states. The UN now is close to 200. Mm -hmm. We had a very credible army at the time. So when he proposed a peacekeeping force, we actually had an aircraft carrier ready to go we had a battalion ready to go within days. We couldn't do that now. Yeah. Um, I think on defense issues, we're always going to have to defer to the US, generally. Um, I think we'll be able to make our mark on the soft power part of the spectrum with development assistance, with diplomacy itself. Um, it takes willpower. It takes actually having a prime minister like Trudeau, who, like Pearson, is open, intellectually curious, um, we've gone through a pretty dismal decade, a pretty ineffectual, counterproductive decade. So I think, I hope, that Canada is back. Okay, the Conservatives who are watching us now will want me to follow up on that. What Indeed. do you mean ineffectual and, and you know, useless decade? I could go on at length about Harper. <laughs> Harper is the anti-Pearson in many ways. Um, it, it's such a, I mean, I, I was writing the book during the Harper years, and whenever I thought, this is pointless, why am I doing this? Harper would do something, like break off relations with Iran. That would just make me, you know, pull my hair out. Um, I don't think Harper understood diplomacy, really, how to use it. Um, you don't go down to the United States when you're obsessed with building a pipeline and tell them it's a no-brainer, quote, to accept it. You don't tell them also on homes, their home ground, quote, um, we're not taking no for an answer. Middle powers don't act like that. You don't treat environmentalists as if they were um, criminals and then be surprised that you don't have an environmental coalition to help you build that pipeline. Uh, there were so many instances where he just didn't um, understand what diplomacy is. He also had six foreign ministers in under 10 years. And when you've got a revolving door like that, you just you cannot master the file. Yeah, but there are a lot of people who like the fact that he stood up for Israel really strongly. There are a lot of That's people fine. who like the fact that he shook hands with Putin and said, get the hell out of Ukraine. Um, you know, you know maybe the record's more balanced than you're giving it credit for. I, I would like it to be. I want someone to tell me when the records are open that he actually did serve our interests. I haven't seen a single thing that hasn't been written by someone who worked for him that suggests otherwise. Let's finish up on this. Pearson once mulled over the idea of having civilian peacekeepers. Mm. Is that something we ought to be considering today? I think we did some experimenting with that in Afghanistan. We had things called PRTs, Provincial Reconstruction Teams. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Pearson was a very, um, he had a very holistic approach to diplomacy. He wanted NATO to have an economic social function. He wanted the UN to have a fighting force. You know, he, and he also, you know, it has to be stressed, peacekeeping was a temporary measure for him. He wanted a peace settlement in the Middle East, and he thought the peacekeepers would just go in there hold the ring, 
and that the great powers would create a peace settlement. They were not there to be an end in themselves. Hmm. Anthony, it's a nice read. Thank you. Learned a lot. Great. Including why they call him Mike. <laughs> the Diplomat, Lester Pearson and the Suez Crisis, Anthony Anderson. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.